So 86 percent of the maternal mortalities um, in the adverse birth outcomes are preventable. Eighty six percent. That's that blows my mind. And reason being is because a lot of times when you look at the cases, if you look at the labs or you'll see the warning signs. So that's why I'm Mm -hmm. like, no, we have to be empowered to know ourselves and not just depend solely on the provider, you know, but that is, that is a part of the catalyst for a lot of things that we feel when we feel overwhelmed Mm -hmm. and the anxiety or why I feel so down. And you don't realize it's a subconscious thing, like treating the whole person because it's Mm -hmm. all connected, you know, right. You can't, you can't ignore, we can't talk about your mental health without talking about your sleep. We can't talk about your mental health without talking about your nutrition or your relationships. And so I always empower moms like, no, you know, your body, if something is off or wrong, speak up and you want to make sure you have a provider, um, you know, a midwife or, you know, an OBGYN who listens and who you feel hurt by. You don't feel like, you know, just the number or they're just doing their job for the day or, Mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing. And there's a lot that goes into this whole postpartum body thing. Can you kind of touch on that a little bit? Because what happens? I don't know. (laughs) Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Creating a Village. I'm your host, Millie, here to help nurture the village within you. And today we have an extremely special guest with us. Can you please introduce yourself to the audience? Yes. So I am Dr. Kim Lowe, um, or Kimberly Lee Okanya is my full name. And I am a licensed clinical social worker. So I'm a mental health and holistic wellness therapist. I wear a few hats. I also teach a birth doula, um, social worker, all the things, all things wellness. Um, I am the owner and executive director of a private practice, Life Begins Here, Therapeutic and Counseling Services, and we are located um, brick and mortar in, in Atlanta, Georgia, but you can log on and we have tons of virtual services that we offer. And then also the founder of the Millenated Mommy Tribe, which is a organization that falls up under Life Begins Here, but it focuses on all things Black maternal mental health. Um, So that's a little bit about me. And I guess personally, I'm a mom of two. Um, I've been married. We we will celebrate 11 years this year. Uh, Congratulations. Um, Thank you. And um, let's see, I'm an Atlanta native, been here my whole life, but my dream is to live abroad one day in a tropical climate. So mm. that's just a little bit about me. Yeah. That sounds nice. That sounds yes. nice. Right. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, well, I didn't see the documentary, but like on Netflix, there's like a documentary, I think about like expats, like people who want to live abroad or like give up their U S citizenships or something like that. Wow. So I thought that was like really interesting, but I haven't looked into it. So that's okay, I need to watch that. Yeah, no, I, I love, but hey, that's a part of wellness. Go where you feel like your most authentic self, where you can be. So I like, I like that. I'm going to look that up on Netflix. Okay. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, I So my first question for you would be, with your mini hats that you wear, which role did you get into first? Hmm. Um, so the role that I got into first uh I would say is the role of therapist. I feel like I've been a therapist my whole life because I Mm -hmm. was that friend in middle school where your friends just come and tell you all the things, all the secrets, you know, and stuff like that. And also the go-to person in my family. And so it just kind of naturally, you know, was just, I felt like it was my calling and purpose. Initially I went to school for, I was a pre-dent, uh, biology major and mm-hmm. so I thought I wanted to be a dentist like my whole life I was like I want to be a dentist I just I just love teeth smiles you know <laughs> you I just a really it. nice smile really thank nice teeth. you oh thank you so much your smile is beautiful too oh, um thank you. so you're welcome so I just love teeth so I went to school and then I was like mm, I don't think this is for me and so I had a, a mentor a professor who was the one who told me about 
social work and um, that was it from there. So that's how I would say that um, is the main role that I play. I mean, and our mental health yeah. controls everything, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it determines how we navigate life, how we show up, what we think about ourselves, all the things. And so I feel like, yeah, that's just at the, the core. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. I like that. Yeah. I like that journey. Um, <laughs> so then in terms of maternal mental health, can you kind of, I guess, break down what that maternal aspect is? Like, how could that kind of differ or be similar to that of regular mental health? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> great question. So maternal mental health uh, basically is mental health after or during the process of you becoming a mom. So it could be and what we call like the perinatal period, that means mm -hmm. you when you're pregnant. Um, and then when we say postpartum, that is like the first year right after you give mm -hmm. birth. Usually, typically, some people we look at it as two years, but traditionally it's been that first year after birth. And it talks about like how the mental health changes once you become a mom. Like, I, I don't think people, of course, we've been birthing kids since the beginning of time literally mm -hmm. you know but I don't think people um historically took into account like the changes that um a person's body goes through as you are preparing to birth a child and even afterwards you know all the hormones like you're you're literally growing a human inside of you right yeah and so there's like a, a lot of different hormones a lot of physiological changes that happen for um, moms that might have had, you know, say depression before or anxiety, um, mm -hmm. it might heighten once they become a mom, you know. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, maternal health is just all things, you know, as that process starts for the body to grow, birth, and then become a mom, because then now you have this little baby who is dependent on you for life. And so the the weight of that. I know a lot of times on social mm -hmm. media, at least again, historically, they're doing better now just in terms of like highlighting things like postpartum depression or the other side of motherhood, not just the, you know, happy stuff. But I think um, it's very important to find that balance to show like, if you are going through these things, you aren't alone, you aren't an anomaly, you know, normalize it because actually one in five mothers in general experience postpartum depression and one in three black women experience postpartum depression and that's what's reported so it could be a little bit you know yeah. more than that um so and that's not including postpartum anxiety or other like mm -hmm. mood uh disorders which we can get into if the conversation uh leads that way but yeah so Hopefully that answered the question a little bit about what is meant by like maternal mental health. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. And so the follow up question kind of that an audience member asked was, you just explained what maternal mental health is, but they want to know why is it important for both moms and their families to understand that? Yes, because that's a great question, because a lot of times um, families, a lot of times the mom doesn't really know what is going on, you know, and mm -hmm. it may not be easy for, we might just think it's normal, especially if it's your first child. And I always say with every child, it can be different. You can have one mm -hmm. experience, the first child, or you might have 10 kids and on the 10th one have a very different experience. It's not a one size fits all. Right. And so it's very important for family members to recognize the signs because postpartum, depression or maternal mental health, it, it, it impacts the whole family. It could impact mm -hmm. the mom's ability to um, bond with her baby. It can cause um, issues within the relationship with the partner because it's like, oh, now she's a little bit, you know, standoffish or, you know, she's crying all the time. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's me. And so then the partner kind of pulls back because they're not sure what's going on. Um, and then also with, family, uh, it's just important to know to check in on mom um, mm -hmm. it, or both partners, you know, because a lot of times people call and I've been there like, how's the baby? You know, how's the baby doing? I want to come and check on the baby, which is important, but 
typically the baby is fine, right? But it's it's very um, rare most times that people check in to just see how mom, have you ate today? Have you showered? Like, have you slept? Because that's one of the things, the, the sleep deprivation is big with newborns, you know. Um, well, I won't even say newborns. My my youngest is six and she still gets up sometimes at night mm-hmm. and disrupts sleep. So um, yeah, so things like that, that's why it's important because it can impact the whole family unit. In fact, they just came out with a diagnosis for dads, um, which is called paternal postpartum depression. So it's dads mm-hmm. who suffer depression when their partners give birth. So it's a real thing. Um, so it's very important. Yeah. Did I answer the question? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. No, it okay. did. Um, yeah. And just to get into it. So what are some common mental health issues? I guess both moms and dads kind of face either well is there like a before and during there probably is a before during and after this process of mm-hmm. giving birth <laughs> you mean in terms of like um like a measure or just a picture of looking at like what the the changes are hmm sure Okay. I feel like that's a good place to start. <laughs> yeah, right. This is so, okay. Um, it just depends. I would mm. say, you know, so one thing when I, and I'll talk specifically for moms here in like the United States families, right? So, you know, the United States, um, we're like one of the only countries that don't have um, benefits that cover, um, what am I trying to say? Like postpartum benefits in terms mm. of like, um, why can I think of the word? My brain today. Oh, like um, maternity leave or yes, like mandatory. Very, thank you. Maternity leave, maternity like, and when you're on the when you're on leave, being compensated for that. Mm-hmm. Other um, countries they have maternity leave up to like two years. They also have oh, paternity wow. leave for dads as well. Because think about it, most of us need our jobs to live here, right? And if you don't have that um, support system, say, or that job structure where you can stay out of work with your child a lot of moms you are trying to go back to work within six weeks and so that's a lot of pressure right you just Mm -hmm. grew this child inside of you for 40 weeks that's typically the full term pregnancy and now you have to leave your baby and Mm -hmm. go back to work right so think about the mental health impact of that think about the weight um you know just like i gotta get back out here and work your body has not even fully healed and not even to mention if you had a c-section i think you Mm -hmm. usually get about eight weeks if you have a cesarean section and six weeks for um a vaginal delivery so Mm -hmm. um that's one thing so one of the top stressors is like finances um relationship changes you know sleep deprivation um and that's just you know so from those things come depression um anxiety things like that. Um, Your eating habits change. You might eat more, you might eat less. Um, Mm -hmm. If you have other kids in the home, like that's another factor to think about, like how do you balance and manage the time between the two and relationship issues happen because I know a lot of people think, you know, once you have the baby and the baby's home, everything's great with the couple, but it takes even more intentional effort to like have time to connect, you know, because now you got this little this little nugget that you, you know, that needs you that you have to take care of. Right. So, um, so yeah. And so I guess if you say pre and post, like if I used to deal with anxiety. Um, Mm -hmm. and so if I already had anxiety just even prior to becoming a parent, then, you know, if I don't have the right supports or resources in place, it would naturally, um, it could naturally heighten. You know, so I guess, but if you don't have something um, like a pre uh, diagnosis or anything like Mm -hmm. that, those things are still typical that I named just the sleep deprivation, the eating changes. Uh, We won't even get into the social media snapback culture that a lot of moms, you know, Mm -hmm. you've heard of that before, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the weight of that, the body image, yeah. I actually have a question about that because yeah. recently because of social media, I've been learning that like after you give birth, you like 
I don't know how long you bleed, but you bleed a lot. And there's a lot that goes into this whole postpartum body thing. Can you kind of touch on that a little bit? Because yeah. what happens? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so okay. So I'm going to see how, I, how to sum it up. So basically, after you give birth, let's say you have a vaginal delivery, right? Mm-hmm. Um, your body has to then after that, I don't know if you know, you have to also like birth the placenta out so that's the bag that the baby was in while oh. you were and it's 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 during while you're in the hospital you might be mm. doing skin to skin with your baby and then they allow it to come out and then from there that's it oh. yeah but it I takes thought the time. placenta was that cord oh that's the umbilical cord that's Never the mind. umbilical cord right <laughs> and then the umbilical cord attached to the placenta yeah oh uh. And so now you might, well, I don't know, you might have heard like um, a lot of people recommend delayed cord clamping. And so basically what that is, is once the baby comes out and has the, you know, the umbilical cord, usually back in the day, they would snip it right away. But now they say Mm -hmm. it's a lot of nutrients and a lot of like um, great life giving qualities in that. And so allowing it to just prolong to what they call delayed cord clamping. Like Mm -hmm. just allowing that. And so that's the, yes. So the umbilical cord is the piece that's attached to that um, placenta. Yeah. Okay. And so Mm -hmm. then after that, um, so it varies, um, I think. Uh, So you might bleed some, like for instance, I can use myself personally. Um, I didn't, I had some like discharge afterwards. So it can be bleeding or just any, you know, your, your, for to use the correct terminology your your body your vagina clearing itself out Mm -hmm. and so usually you can see that for um it's not like heavy like a cycle or anything Mm -hmm. like that but you can just see that you know for like a a week or two following delivery but it's not like intense bleeding it shouldn't be yeah okay If if that's happening i would say you know follow up with your your doctor but it Mm -hmm. shouldn't be any intense bleeding or anything like that. Okay, because I was definitely thinking like you had an immediate cycle after birth. Okay, so that's good. A a lot of women, well, and it varies because with my my first pregnancy, I didn't, you usually don't have a, well, it varies, let me say that, because some women don't get a cycle for, they could, it could be another year, even after, yeah, giving birth. Could they still get pregnant? They could, or, yeah, they can. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So the body is a is a whole thing. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, oh. yeah. So it's something about the. They say it's something connected to like breastfeeding that might keep the cycle from coming back, you know, immediately. But some women have had totally opposite experiences, and their cycle comes back, you know, within six to eight weeks after mm. giving birth. So it's it just varies, you know, my, myself was different in both pregnancies. So it just varies based on the person. Yeah. Okay. And one last question I have about post delivery. Um, is the diaper that some people get, or I don't know if everyone gets it, like, mm-hmm. is that for the potential bleeding or is that for something else? Or like, yeah, that's for the, the any, yeah, that's for any, any, any discharge. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, usually you should be able to control like your your bowels or, you know, if you mm-hmm. have to, you know, anything like that. So that is usually typically just that that discharge we talked about after okay. that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just to make sure you are covered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Got you. So now I'm going to ask another question from the audience. Um, okay. Oh, someone wanted to know... With social media showing only happy moments of motherhood, um, oh, how can this ap- impact a new mom's mental health? You say you're, so the question is with social media just showing the positive, how can that impact a new mom's mental health? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, very, very uh, greatly it can have an impact because I think, you know, like we talked about just a little bit earlier. Um, a lot of times, which that's to me in general, social media, because we only post what we want to be seen. It's not like mm-hmm. we have a camera 
following us 24 seven to show our down moments or failures. It's only what we choose to post. Right. And so yeah. I think that's the thing with social media. It does. It shows the moms who are like, you know, in postpartum at running with their baby in the, you know, stroller or having play dates at music classes or, uh, you know, breastfeeding with mom, whatever, all the, mm. the positive things or the happy pics, but it doesn't show um, those moms that we mentioned that one in five or that one in three that's dealing with postpartum depression or they're having a hard time connecting to their baby or they're grieving the loss of their old selves. A lot of a lot of people don't talk about that. Like once you become a mom, you oh. have to you have to move differently. Your body is not the same. You know, literally, they say once a, a woman passes, you can look at her body and her bones and tell if she was a mother or not. Like you literally oh. change, you know? Um, yeah. And so it's, it's, I, I hear a lot of moms talk about losing friends, you know, um, because especially if other mom or those friends don't have kids, you know, they might stop inviting you places like, Oh, she with the baby, she can't come. So mm -hmm. it's a whole grieving process that can go also with, um, you know, becoming a mom that is not out there on social media. So people, new moms who see that might feel isolated if all they're seeing is the happy because they don't identify with what they're seeing on social media. So then that can make them isolate, that can make them kind of, you know, close off to others because they feel alone, you know, and that every the norm is that all the other moms are moms, you should be happy, you should be posting, you know, have you know, you wear makeup and all the things yeah. and dress to the T and you can't have on sweats, whatever, you know, and so that can make um, a mom feel really alone and maybe not ask for for help because the perception is new motherhood should look like this. And that doesn't align with what that new mom is feeling. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So that brought up a good question from you all, a question. Do you have any recommendations for the types of classes that um, a a potential mother wants, like if someone wants to become a mother, that they should take? And then the if there are classes, I guess, afterwards that yeah. they should be taking. Right. So um, and I definitely can. So on our website, the Millinated Mommy Tribe dot com, there are some resources there um, and we'll be updating that soon as well but there are classes like through um it's an organization called postpartum support international um they have it's international but they have chapters by state so if you're in georgia mm -hmm. they have a chapter here um and they offer like free classes courses things like that also depending on if you're having a baby at like a birth center or a hospital most times they have classes your insurance company or the hospital itself has classes. Um, also at the Melanated Mummy Tribe, we have some um, groups that we do and courses or workshops, if you will, in a community that we're building to talk about like having an empowered birth. Cause I always say birth is 80% mental. Like how you mm. go in, if you're feeling empowered, you know, if you're feeling like I can do this, like all the, literally we have birth nations since the beginning of time. Like if we stop, the world stops. So like, getting that empowering, that empowerment and feeling liberated. And so we kind of, um, not kind of, we teach those types of tools, breathing techniques, different positions, because I'm also a, a trained birth doula. And so I wanted to make sure like I had all those mm -hmm. different, you know, signs, sides to be able to help moms and partners. We also have a workshop called bringing baby home, which is for couples. Um, to help them understand the expectations or like what to expect, um, whether it's your first child or your fifth, because it's different every child mm -hmm. you have and you bring into the home. So, yes, it's, it's a lot of resources out there, um, a lot of postpartum groups as well. So some that actually prepares you um, physically and then those that prepare you mentally or I like to just say holistically. Yeah, they're there are courses, classes, workshops, groups out there that's available. And I'll share that resource with you so you can share it with your audience. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know I saw a question here. I can't find it right now, but I saw a question about preparation for the body. I, I believe they were asking um, if you know of any myths 
or anything? Because I know, for instance, like my mom says, oh, as soon as you think you're about to be pregnant, start oiling your body or even oiling your body now before you even meet your husband or whatever. So your body can have better elasticity. Are there any mm-hmm. types of preparation myths or any ones that you you might not swear by, but you're like, ah, I think this is pretty good. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. I'm trying to think there because there are so many myths. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's good to keep your body moisturized, period. I don't know if that will help with, you know, elasticity of your stomach. But I know that's one thing they talk about, you know, shea butter, stuff like that, usually Mm -hmm. to help with um, uh, like stretch marks and discoloration and and things like that. Um, Mm -hmm. But some women regardless of how much oil they put on, have reported like their skin being itchy as it expands, you know, um, that might be a rare thing. So that might be where that myth comes from. Um, mm. but I think it's just good to moisturize, period, whether you're preparing for pregnancy or not. Um, and then there used to be one where um, they would tell you, like, as you're preparing a birth, like kind of massaging the vaginal opening down there that would kind of help maybe with tears and stuff like that um they say scientifically that that doesn't really um matter you know but i know Mm. a lot of women did that i did that with the first pregnancy and the second one i didn't and was totally fine you know Um, it tears yes it can tear it can tear so the you know Uh it's a it's an elastic you know the vagina is an elastic um, has a lot of elasticity, you know, and can expand. It ah. expands up to 10 centimeters, you know, that's when you're nine centimeters, that's when you're fully dilated, and then that's when the baby can start to make their way into the world. Yeah, but mm-hmm. it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a lot, but I think that, I think that's beautiful, you know, that your body it can is. do that, right? <laughs> Don't get like, don't get freaked out. But I think that's why it's good to have these conversations. Right. Because a lot of times it's like I'm pregnant and I've I've never heard that. And now I'm freaking out and I'm 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 like, what is that? I'm scared. And so that's why I think it's important just to know all the things Mm. and prepare as best as you can. I think knowledge is power and preparation is key, you know, and that's why we do like birth plans. Um, So we kind of talk about, you know, your birth team, you know, all of those things, what happens to the body. Those classes talks uh, talk a lot about that, too. So some of them have like the the little, um, you know, um, the pelvis and it shows you how the baby Mm -hmm. is in the body. You know, you might have seen some of those come in and what to expect and all that. But, yeah, so that's why those classes are good, too. Interesting. You just mentioned a birth team. Mm-hmm. Who, how many people are, should be on a birth team? Like, yeah, well, I can recommend, <laughs> I, what I recommend. So, um, and I know in California and New York, they have allowed birth doulas to be covered by insurance. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think they did that for Medicaid um, clients, patients as well. Georgia is always a little bit behind the eight ball with things and things come to us a little later. Um, but I always say a birth doula, but there are, let me say, let me back up. There are a lot of um, organizations though, that for black and brown moms specifically because of the, you know, maternal mortality rates mm-hmm. and things like that and birth complications and adverse birth outcomes are where they offer um, a birth doula through their program where they will cover it for you. Um, so oh, a birth a right birth right. doula is really oh, wait. good. Okay. Quick question for the uh-huh. audience: What is a birth doula? Yes. So a birth doula is a non medical professional who helps the mom with um, birth and, and the partner too. So basically, you know, when you go into a hospital or when you go into your OB, they focus on the baby, like you mm-hmm. know that's it this the birth doula is solely for mom so basically she helps with he or she can help with um you know relaxation techniques you know they know your birth plan so they're your advocate in the room because imagine you were trying to birth a baby your mom may not be in the the right space you know in terms Mm -hmm. of somebody asking you a question or they want to 
implement a, a intervention or do something like that, most times you're going to just say yes to anything because you, you're just trying to have this baby. So that birth doula knows your birth plan, knows what you want. They've been with you throughout the pregnancy. Um, so they help you with different positions, deep oh. breathing. They can help set the, um, the room for you if you want low lighting, you know, if you want aromatherapy. They can help give massage while you birth, you know, walk around mm. with you, um, can can teach you the different things to help your body have less pain, you know, just naturally. Um, because years ago, they didn't have nothing wrong with epidurals and things like that. But years ago, they didn't have those things. Right. But mm -hmm. again, the population is here. So they were doing something right. And so um, they help with those types of things. So they've been around for a long time. I think it's just becoming, you know, people are just now hearing the word doula a little bit more to understand what it is. But basically it was just like the mom's village, you know, like you had the midwife, um, you had the, the doula, the support around to help you, you know, make sure that you were relaxed and get the baby, you know, here safely. Um, make sure you have all your needs. You want some ice cubes. You want whatever it is you want. They just focus on mom. And then if okay. um, the partner is there as well, they make sure they're okay. Because I always say not only is a baby being born, but so is a mom. So is a dad, you know. And so a lot of times they need that um, nurturing, that safe space as well to be loved on um, as they go into this process of motherhood. You know, so that is what a doula is. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I definitely thought they showed up when the baby was being born. I didn't realize they were there throughout the whole process, but that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have, you have, um, so there's different, there's so many different types of doulas. Um, you can have a full spectrum doula, which means they're there throughout the pregnancy and all the way in the postpartum period, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have a birth doula who is there, you know, with you up until the birth. And then her main role is, or their main role is to be there at the birth during labor and delivery. A postpartum doula, their role starts once the baby is earthside. And so they can help with, you know, making sure mom's mental health is fine. Some of those things we talked about, you know, before, you know, are you eating? Have you showered? You know, um, does the baby have everything they need? Some doulas stay overnight, you know, where mom can mm -hmm. sleep and then they help, you know, and maybe give her the baby when the baby needs to nurse or they feed the baby, different things like that. So different doulas do different things, but they, they have, um, grief doulas for moms who lose babies you know they have all types of doulas who um who specialize in different parts of that maternal journey so yeah so that's a doula so i would definitely recommend them being on the team um because statistics show when you have a doula present you know their higher success rates less adverse birth outcomes also make sure you have a provider that you're comfortable with where you feel seen and you feel heard because I know a lot of times we just go along with whatever the doctor says. And I always say, you know, we are the expert on ourselves. So if something feels mm -hmm. off, if something doesn't feel right, a lot of times, especially as, um, you know, people of color, we may not say anything or we may feel um, minimized. So we just go along with whatever the doctor says. And so I always empower moms like, no, you know your body. If something is off or wrong, speak up. And you want to make sure you have a provider um, you know, a midwife or, you know, an OBGYN who listens and who you feel hurt by, you don't feel like, you know, just the number or they're just doing their job for the day or, mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing. So making sure you have that and then making sure you have people in the room, at least one or two people. So that can be your partner, mom, um, friend, a cousin or whoever, who you feel has that good energy where it really just, uh, makes you feel inspired like I can do this you know so make sure don't have people in there that stress you out you know <laughs> even more or you worried about them too much um while you're trying to deliver so that's kind of like um that's an example of like what that birth team would I would recommend you know those people look like yeah mm, okay and just for clarification on the provider the provider is the person who is delivering the baby correct yes okay. yes mm -hmm. okay 
who actually delivers the baby. Okay. So an OBGYN can deliver the baby. I thought they were just like the checkup doctor. I no. guess you know what that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. They did. They <laughs> they deliver the babies. But if you look back in historical times, I mean, even if you know, I'm a believer. So even in the Bible, in Genesis, they mention midwives. Like they've been mm-hmm. midwives are historically OBGYNs are a little bit newer. Like when we just mm-hmm. look at the whole world scope historically. But yes, midwives are who um, deliver babies and now OBGYNs, um, they deliver the babies too. But yes, you're right. That's who you go see at the doctor. Usually you see the nurse mainly and they check the heart rate and heartbeat and your vitals and stuff like that. And then the doctor comes in, follows up, see if anything is wrong, how you feeling. And that's pretty much that process. And then with doctors, if you go into a group practice, whoever is on rotation or on call during your pregnancy is typically who you see. But I know a lot of moms nowadays are opting for midwives, one, because, again, because of the statistics and things like Mm -hmm. that, uh, the adverse birth outcomes are a little lower when you opt for, you know, a midwife and then you have a doula you know, things like that. And really it's just that support and feeling supported. Yeah. That's why I say it's, it's, it's really 80% mental, being prepared, knowing your labs. That's a part of the empowerment piece because 86%, I think was the recent statistic of maternal mortalities. And basically what that means just for, you know, just to clarify, maternal mortalities is you, um, you die giving birth during Mm -hmm. the pregnancy, giving birth or in the postpartum period. So something maternal related, right? And then adverse birth outcomes might be, you have to have an intervention that you didn't expect. So it could be an emergency C-section. You know, you could have had some uh, preeclampsia or issue, some type of issue during the pregnancy or afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so, now, so I just wanted to give that, define that, give a little bit more context. So 86% of the maternal mortalities um, and the adverse birth outcomes are preventable. 86%, that's, that blows oh, wow. my mind. And reason being is because a lot of times when you look at the cases, if you look at the labs or you'll see the warning signs. So that's why I'm mm-hmm. like, no, we have to be empowered to know ourselves and not just depend solely on the provider, you know, know your labs, know what your blood pressure, know what blood pressure is, why that's important, you know, different things like that, creatinine, different levels, you know, that they check for in pregnancy, knowing those, and then if something's off, you know, and then you go from there. That's, that's a, that's a part of it. But yeah, so that is, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Can, do you, can you give an example of, I guess a warning sign I would know about my bo- my doctor would well, no not my doctor about my body to tell my doctor or midwife before mm-hmm. um so that the adverse I forgot what you call it adverse what adverse birth outcomes oh, so an adverse birth outcome. outcome uh-huh mm. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, so one of them might be, um, some of the common signs is like swelling, like in your extremities. Mm -hmm. So in your hands and your feet, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe in your face, things like that. Um, one might be like migraines, lightheadedness, blurry vision, things like that. Um, it could be the, so those are, those are some of the top, you know, and then I Mm -hmm. always say, even if it doesn't fall into one of those categories, like, knowing your body. I always say if that's what the provider is supposed, that's what your team is supposed to be there for. So even if you don't know, if it's like, oh, my my neck has been hurting for the last week, it may not have anything to do with your pregnancy, still report it. Like don't, mm-hmm. I know a lot of times, especially, um, you know, women of color, especially black women, we just, when you look at the statistics you know in terms of healthcare as well we just kind of oh it's okay it's not a big thing or you know we we might minimize it you know for Mm -hmm. whatever reason and I can that'll be a whole nother podcast (laughs) uh, interview to get into those things you know um, because it's just we wear these superwoman capes a lot of times I don't know if you heard of Sojourner Truth Syndrome or, um, you know, the Superwoman Mm -hmm. Complex, all of those types of things that's really big for Black women in America. Um, And so we don't 
may not always we just suck it up a lot of times, but that could be to our sure is to our detriment. Right. Yeah. Um, so I always say if anything feels off, even if it's not one of the common things reported, you know, like let your provider know, let your doula know. Um, and I think that's why it's important to have your doula on the team as well, because they've been with you and they can say, oh, Millie, that's kind of off. You didn't that that's new. Let's let's follow up on that. Maybe we should get the provider involved or, you know, they can kind of be there to, to walk with you because I know it's mm-hmm. overwhelming. It may be overwhelming for a lot of women just being pregnant and trying to prepare. So then trying to add I got to remember this. I got to know this. I got to know that can be a lot. Right. So having that person on your team who you can talk to, who kind of knows the ropes a little bit um, is another reason why I would recommend like a doula or, um, you know, maybe even a friend who's well versed um, in those Mm -hmm. things or just, yeah, somebody supportive, like I said, who, yeah, on your on your on your team in your village. (laughs) yes um i have a question from the audience about uh maternal morality uh what role can young people play in advocating for better maternal health care and support Hmm. that's a good question i think um one thing is um just being more vocal and, and normalizing like using your voice. I think that's mm-hmm. a that's a big part of it. Knowing your worth, right? And knowing that you have choices. Um, I think that young people um, do a really good job now just sounding the alarm on a lot of things. And so I think more of that. Um, also being involved, like, you know, they have like maternal health day at the Capitol. Check and see when yours oh. is, you know, maybe write a letter to your a governor about Medicaid expansion if if you don't have that in your state and basically what Medicaid expansion would do is for moms who are on Medicaid it would expand so first it was just um, I believe it was six weeks um, after birth but then a lot of times these postpartum uh, mortalities or something would happen after that period and then they wouldn't have insurance or have any coverage so they were pushing for the expansion to be at least a year after birth and really in some states two years after birth. So things like that, like really advocating for um, different laws to be passed in your state, um, for insurance to cover doula services, um, maybe becoming a doula. You know, um, I know doulas who don't have kids, you know, and so you, you don't have to be a parent. Um and, you know, it's, they have a certification process and all of that. And so you could become a doula, a birth support person. So I would say, you know, different things like that. And, um, yeah, normalize asking for help. Normalize not being mm. okay. Normalizing that it's okay to use your voice if something feels wrong, even if the person you're talking to has a what you feel is a superior role as a doctor. I remember my doctor told me really only when it comes to healthcare do people just take whatever their doctors say. So the the mm-hmm. example he gave me was if you go take your car in to get the oil changed and usually they come back with this whole like diagnostic of everything that needs to be done. You need new brakes, you need rotors, you need this, you need that. And it's like, no, just give me, just fix, you know, just change my oil and then I'll come back later. But if a doctor comes and tells us these things, sometimes we don't challenge it. We just go with Mm. whatever they say. And so he says, he told me, like, I'm not sure why people do that, you know, Um, because doctors are still people. They're still humans. I'm I'm a therapist and I've been doing it well over a decade. but I don't know everything. Right. I might be a doula. I might be a mom. I might be a wife. And I've had, you know, tons of training and certification and schooling in those areas. I don't know everything. I'm still human. I'm still flesh. Things are evolving. Knowledge evolves. You know, if we look at the world even just two years ago and then we're post pandemic, you know, it things have changed drastically. And so I think that's part of that empowerment piece is like empowering people like you are the expert on you. Use your voice and, mm. you know, go from there. Yeah. So I hope I answered the question. I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> 
<laughs> you did. It's just how can young people uh, help advocate? Yes. For, like, okay. Yeah. I yeah. your answer brought up a question for me that I've kind of been thinking about a little bit. So with social media, I have seen the comparison of like the American health system when it comes to what is provided for a mom giving birth, like when it comes to hospital rooms, mm -hmm. the attention they get, maternity leave, and compare it to other countries. And so I've very much so been thinking about the idea of going out the country to give birth. I don't know how that would work at all, but I was like, hmm, maybe I need to go to like New Zealand or something. Okay. Um, <laughs> so what, I'm not sure what the question would be on that, but what do you think, how do you think that process would work? Or would you even, if you don't live in that country, would you recommend going, a I don't know how that works. How would yeah. <laughs> I, well, to be honest with you, Millie, I'm not 100% sure how it works, but I know, so I used to um, work as a, a OB, so um, a maternal health social worker at mm -hmm. um, a hospital here in Atlanta, a major hospital, and we would have a lot of moms that would come from out of their countries here to deliver birth, actually, mm. um, for whatever reason, depending on whatever, you know, they were, I mean, from all over the world, they would come here. So I've seen that happen. Now, I'm not sure how it worked for us going somewhere else and mm. giving birth, but I, I a thousand percent understand those sentiments because yes, when you look at the statistics in black and white, first of all, the United States is the only industrialized country without universal health care. You know, mm -hmm. so a lot of times, you know, that could be um, a classist thing or it could be a regional thing. You know, I don't know if you've heard of what they call maternity deserts, which means like mm -hmm. if you live in a rural area, there may not be any maternal health specialty, you know, type places to give birth. And that's been an issue for a mm -hmm. lot of people who live in those areas because those facilities are not equipped to to your point, provide the experience that that family needs for them to have a successful delivery. And so then mm -hmm. that causes some of the adverse birth outcomes that we've talked about. And so I just think, yeah, the our country is really, really, really behind the ball. We have we have the highest maternal mortality rates in the world mm -hmm. um, in the industrialized countries. I'm sorry. Um, and even some of our rates like uh, Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, those southern states usually have the, the higher rates in comparison mm. to the country. And a lot of times those rates that we have here are higher than even some um, unindustrialized countries, you know. And so it's like, what what is what is going on here? You know, that mm. is concerning. And then when you look at the rates, so preeclampsia is a condition that's really high here in terms of, you know, blood pressure and the things we talked about, some of the signs we talked about, those would be some signs of like um, preeclampsia, which is a um, condition that can come up in pregnancy, especially mm -hmm. in black women. However, if you look at other countries, that doesn't even exist. Like if here, let's just say if here 70% of women got that diagnosis in other countries is like zero it's not even an issue and Ooh. so what but, is and pre so, oh and so as a well so as a um social worker right um we look at systems and have you ever heard of weathering before you heard of that no so that's a term which basically means chronic stress like your body mm. is always in fight or flight mode and so for, you know, specifically, you know, black women, um, black people in general, but today black women, um, since we're talking about maternal health, has a high um, weathering component because of the chronic stress that we're always under. You know, one time mm -hmm. I read a study about like how often, how many times a day do you think about your race? Or how many times if you walk in a store and somebody is following you, you think, oh, it's because I'm black or if you go in a room and you recognize oh it's not many other brown faces in here and hmm how how will that impact me or in corporate america your hair you know like how how will this be received i'm walking in this room and everybody looks one way will this be an issue you know recently 
they just passed the Crown Act, what, a, a year or so ago? Do you familiar with that? You heard about that? Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. I just yes. saw an article about it. Yeah. Can you remind me? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so basically, I don't know all the ins and outs, but just the just the the surface level is just where companies, teams, organizations can't discriminate on a person based on their hair. Okay. Um, yeah, because a lot yes. of there, I won't get too deep on it, but it's been a lot of studies, suspensions, mm. all kind of things yeah. tied into right, right, and then who mostly has those types of hair, <clears throat> excuse me, black or brown person, mm -hmm. right, and so. Yeah. And so that was a whole thing. Like, oh, if you're going for a job interview, your hair is not professional. But this is my natural hair state. So why is it not professional? Or why should my hair dictate the type of work that I'm able to to do? You know, those mm -hmm. types of things. So those are things that black women don't realize play a role in stress and stress wreaks havoc on our bodies stress is a mm -hmm. one of the top 10 it can be a it can it can kill you it really can because stress then turns to other things right now you're stressed now i got headaches or i got migraines or mm -hmm. I, the body you know my organs are not um functioning at their highest level of efficiency because I'm constantly in this space of fight or flight. And that's what chronic stress and weathering is. And if you look at the life course perspective of individuals, you know, but specifically black women, you'll see that that stress starts really young, just in terms of kids being aware that, you know, of their ethnicity. And so mm -hmm. those things really weigh on people. We are just um, maybe more conditioned here, you know, because it's just, you just get used to it, but those things really do impact you, you know? And so um, that's what weathering is. And mm. that's that, that chronic stress that a lot of black and brown people experience here um, in this country. And some, some, some states more so, or some regions more so than others, you know, depending on where you live in the state or in the country. So okay. those are things, yeah. And then so weathering leads to the preeclampsia? Well, we have the, it can. Um, mm. I'm just saying in terms of the stress, in terms of looking at in comparison to other countries, why is it not an issue there as opposed to America? And so mm. now I have not, I will say I have not done all the research to present it here today, but that yeah. is just... Um, and I have done research actually on the topic. So that is just something that, you know, I don't have all of it, like I said, lined mm -hmm. out today, but yeah. that is something that is a um, factor when it comes to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yes, it makes a lot of sense. I'm going to ask a question from the audience now. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, with the rise of wellness trends on social media, how can young adults discern mm. uh, what is actually like beneficial for them or what might be harmful or misleading? Oh, wow. That is an amazing question. And really, that's a pact. That is, um, hmm. Yes, because holistic well, I, I will say, especially since the pandemic, has been all types of coaches and wellness professionals and things that are popping up everywhere. And you're right; sometimes it um, has been to the detriment of the person who is looking to receive those services. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to say I, I always like to look at people's receipts as I call it so like in terms of like their on their social media like what is the the can you see they have a lived experience and a professional experience mm. which might for me that's what I look for personally so I want to go to a professional who is practicing what they preach you know like I don't want to be the person say do as I say not as I do you know, um, so is that person engaging in those types of things? And for me, let me back up. Holistic wellness 
for me, like at Life Begins Here, when we talk about being a holistic wellness practice, we focus on, you know, mental and emotional health. We focus on spiritual, you know, spirituality. And we also focus on physical. And physical for us is like nutrition, um, sleep hygiene, of mm -hmm. course, um, your physical activity, those types of things. Spiritual is like um, your connection with God or what keeps you hopeful or wanting to live another day if it feels like the world around you is crashing down. Like what is the connection there? And then, of course, mental and emotional health um, speaks for itself. We kind of look at all of those things. And so I think it's really important to I'm trying to see the best way um, to say it is to really research the provider and feel see if you feel alignment. I know for me, my conscious, I always get a feeling in the pit of my stomach <laughs> if something doesn't feel right. And I, I feel like most people have a conscious. We do. We all are, are built with it. Most people. There are some mm -hmm. outliers maybe who don't um, for whatever reason. But most of us do. And that's one thing I just say, do your due diligence, do your research, check the receipts. Like, are there any um, reviews, feedback, you know, just that type of thing. Don't go for just the first thing that you see. I think that's the best thing I can say without um, going too deep, but that is because I know that's a real issue, you know, today. And I hate that because a lot of people are being um, re-traumatized in some ways or being led, you know, away from what their initial goals were or they're being charged an arm and a leg for services and not getting what they mm -hmm. had intended or wanted to get. So, yeah. So hopefully that gives some insight on how to navigate that yes okay now we're going to get a little personal um mm -hmm. could you share some experiences or an experience um that kind of like stuck out to you that you learned a lesson from with your experience with being either a doula therapist one yeah. of your many hats <laughs> right um Yes. So I guess I can share the experience, like my birth experiences, which is why I'm so passionate about um, Black maternal mental health and Black maternal health in general. Um, so when I had my first child, my son, I have two kids right now. Mm -hmm. um, and when I had my my son, you know, my pregnancy, I worked at a, um, a hospital, which, you know, is open 24-7. So it was it was very, very intense um, all the time. I had to work holidays, you know, all the things. Mm -hmm. um, and it weighed. I didn't like my job. Let's just say that it was a lot of job stress, um, a lot of discrimination that I faced at that job um, and that I internalized. And so that impacted my pregnancy. Also, during that time, my doctor went on a sabbatical. And so I was left with the practice doctors. None mm. of them looked like me, which is OK, but I did not feel comfortable with them. I kind of I felt like um, a number almost. Mm. And I remember always being pressured when I would go to be induced and things like that. And I didn't know it was my first pregnancy. I did all the prenatal classes and Lamaze and learned about all the things. But the mental piece, you know, was not there. It just taught mm. you like different things to try to prepare your body or, you know, what the birth would look like, but nothing for mom in terms of the mental piece, if that makes sense. So um, long story short, I ended up having to, I um, had a traumatic birth experience. Um, I ended up having to have an emergency C-section. I lost a lot of blood. Um, and I, again, for lack of time, you know, we'll just say it was traumatic. And I ended mm -hmm. up having to stay in the hot, my son ended up having, to be checked out by like NICU. Um, I did what not is get NICU? the NIC, NICU is um, the neonative intensive care unit. So, you know, in hospitals, you hear like ICU mm -hmm. and people have to go there if they're on like life support, you know, or things like that. They need a lot okay. more extra care around the clock. And then once they get stable, they put them in a regular room. It's, the, it's for uh, babies. So okay. basically after a baby is born, um, if they're having any kind of issues that's out of the norm, 
they'll go to NICU. So a lot of your like pre preterm um, mm -hmm. deliveries, so babies who are born early, they have a long stint or time in the NICU. You okay. know, they have to be monitored around the clock, things like that. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so my, my son had to go there. Um, my husband, he had to choose the doctor asked him, you stay with your wife or you go with your, your son. And so I told him, you know, go with the baby. Yeah. Mm. As they, um, I lost a lot of blood. And so as I'm going through that, he had to go and be with our son. And so, um, yeah. And I didn't even get to have skin to skin, hold my baby or do anything until hours after. And so by that mm -hmm. time, you know, usually they you do skin to skin. As soon as the baby comes out, they put the baby on mom's chest. And then you um, usually they want you to like nurse the baby. So the baby, you know, latch the baby for breastfeed and things like that. We didn't get to do any of those things. And so mm -hmm. it really impacted um, just those first few months of his life. And for me, it led me into like postpartum depression and all the things. Now, fast forward to baby number two. I remember now, mind you, I was a therapist on all the things at that time still, but mm -hmm. I still, um, yeah, I still had that experience where none of us are above it. It can happen to any of us if we just don't have the the tools and know the knowledge and use our voice, right? So second time around, I had a doula. Her name was Libby. She's amazing. And I remember I went back to the same doctor because most of us, we don't, we just go back. We don't, we don't know like, oh, this is where I go. Let me just go back here. And I remember um, I had, so I had a C-section. I remember telling them my birth plan that I wanted to have a VBAC. So what a VBAC is, it's a vaginal birth after a cesarean. And basically it's when you want to give birth vaginally, you know, um, as opposed to being cut again and having surgery. So C-sections, the United States has like, a very high rate of C-sections as well, uh, which is a problem. And C-sections are is surgery. It's the abdominal mm. surgery because they have to cut through your abdomen to get the, the baby out. And then you have to get stitches and all the things healed and to, you know, afterwards. Uh, whereas a vaginal delivery um, is what it sounds like, you know, um, baby comes out through the vaginal canal. And so I wanted to try for a vaginal birth, but the doctors, you know, at first they were like, oh, it's fine. But they were very dismissive. I felt unheard again and mm -hmm. all the things. And my doula one day after my appointment, I might have been like 28 weeks. And so you go typically 35, 40 weeks for a full term, 36, 40 weeks full term. And so I um, she was like, you should get a second opinion. Like you shouldn't sound deflated you shouldn't sound mm -hmm. down about this because remember i told you birth is like 80 percent, you know mental so i got a second opinion i went to a doctor amazing i feel like he's an angel dr bradford boots taylor um i don't think he's practicing anymore but went there got a second opinion they took me on as a patient ended up having my daughter um naturally so a vaginal birth um unmedicated mm -hmm. no you know um and she was fine, was in and out of the hospital within 36 hours. And so I just, after that experience, I realized how crucial, right? Having that birth team is knowing your worth. And like, I'm so thankful to have had Libby to say, mm, you should get a second opinion. And that's why I told mm -hmm. you, like, even if you have that doula there and you talk to them and they're like, oh, Millie, you sound different today. Like, let's talk about it and see what's going on. How, what's the solution? How can we fix it? And that's why it's important. I, I have no doubt, had I not had her, I would have gone back and had a, probably just did what the doctors told me, even though that's not what I wanted, you know, um, and that would have been the end of it. And who knows if I would have mm -hmm. been here today because of how things went the last time and then looking at the statistics that, are currently facing the United States for, for black women. So I also, after that, that's when I created the melanated mummy tribe, because I'm like, yo, if people can just have that same, know these things and have that support, it can be a night and day difference. And I am a testimony to that. And I know other moms who are too, like who had certain experiences, did things different, a different time around or first time moms who, had those different things and you know you might still have a c-section but it can look they have something called like a family-centered c-section 
and it looks totally different. It's really just about the support and making mm-hmm. sure mom feels mentally grounded and empowered going in it and night and day, night and day. So I think that's um, my biggest why in terms of the Melanated Mummy Tribe um, as a black mom, as a mom who experienced that myself. Um, my doula inspired me to become a doula, you know, because I was like, this, this is, this works. Like this is really big. Um, and just getting back to, the village and how we used to be as a society like the Mm -hmm. united states is very individualistic you know when you turn 16 get a job when you turn 18 get out the house when you're this age you're supposed to have x y and z whereas when you look at other countries they're very um collectivist which means like they all might live in one big house together or everybody lives on the same street or Um, And other countries, once they have babies, they care for the baby for mom to make sure she rests and, you know, recoup and things like that. And then they'll only bring baby when mom's awake or baby needs to feed. It's a whole it's a whole village place. Whereas here, a lot of women feel isolated. I got to hurry up and get back to work. Oh, she got it. You know, she's always been good at just being she'll figure it out that whole superwoman complex, which then you know, makes a lot of women not want to ask for help um, Mm -hmm. or feel ashamed or about asking for help if they need it. Cause grandma had 10 kids and she did it. So who, I just got one, why can't I do it? You know, that type of thing. So those to me, again, you know, the tribe and creating a village. And so that's why I call it the Melanated Mommy Tribe, because it really is about having a village. It makes, it makes a difference. And so yeah, so that's my story of long but not long um, uh, personal experience on my why and why I created um, the Melanated Mommy Tribe. So it's very personal to me. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's very um, deeply rooted and it's something I'm extremely passionate about and that I've centered my life calling and purpose around. So, yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. Well, thank God that you're here today, that you're a okay, that your children are okay. That's beautiful. Right. Um, Amen. Thank you. I have a question. (laughs) Do you need to be, I guess, about to have a child (laughs) to be in the Melanated Mommy Tribe? Well, um, so we do have, like, if you, if you want to come, so say one day I want to be a mom and like, I'm just trying Mm -hmm. to soak up all the things that I can, we do have like groups of resources to prepare. Like you can still, I'm working on a course now that is set to launch in March, but about having an empowered birth. So anybody can be a a part of that. Right. And just like, let's prepare. Like, because a lot of times, even if you're not a mom, your mental health around it are the things that you see impacts, you know, if and when you become one or if you want to be one. You know, I've heard so many um, people say, well, Kim, I like I want to, but I just don't know. I'm scared. Like, I don't want anything to happen to my baby, anything to happen to me. And so absolutely, I feel like, um, yeah, there's a place in the middle of the mommy tribe for those people as well. Yeah. Yes. I have another question and mm-hmm. you, you probably have a lot of them, but if you can think of one or two of your most like fondest moments you've had being a mom. Mm. Wow. That is a, um, that's a tough question. Okay. One um, recently happened last year. My, my son, like I said, I'm a believer and Mm -hmm. my son, um, he got baptized and this was his own um, doing. And, you know, it's just beautiful to see him have, he's nine. um, So he'll be 10 this year. So it's just beautiful just to see him have you know, his own experience um, and connection and relationship and want to deepen that with um god so Mm -hmm. that was just um so beautiful for me i think that's just so important for kids um anybody really you know because the world and life be life and so you (laughs) need something right you need you need that connection to help keep you grounded when things are just 
haywire around you, right? Um, and not only just then, just period, you just need it. Even if things yeah. are lovely bliss, rainbows and daffodils, you still always need God regardless of the space. Um, that's my belief. Um, so that, and then I would say, well, you said one or two. Um, yeah. And there's no limit really. Yeah. I'm trying to think it's so, it's, yeah, it's so, it's so many. Um, also I think my daughter, she's very, um, artsy. She loves dance and music and things like that. So I think watching her, in her first like recital, I oh. you know, I was thinking once she got on the stage, like she was going to be like, oh, this is too much. It's too many people. But she did it. I was like, wow, girl, like she inspired me because I'm like, <laughs> I don't like talking in front of big groups and crowds. So to see her out there, I was like, wow, well, you didn't get that from me. But that's showed amazing. up and showed out. Period. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, OK, look at you. So that was a, a happy mom moment. But I'm I'm just proud of them every day really I mean they have they just yeah so my daughter is six she'll be seven this year so I have a Uh seven and a ten year old this year yeah but they are they're just um I know every mom probably says this but yeah they're just special they're great (laughs) (laughs) oh that's so Mm. beautiful oh thank you so much for sharing this with us okay so now as we're starting to wrap up is there anything that you would like to touch on for the audience that we didn't um, get to? Um, I think one thing, um, especially since the pandemic, I always like to remind people to try to figure out ways to like tap, to go within. And like, mm-hmm. I, I have a book called The Art of Mindless Time. And it's basically about like how to limit distractions, right? Because a lot of times we can't hear or see what we really feel because of all the distractions, you know, Mm. around us, social media, your family says this, your friend thinks that, and we can feel so scattered. And sometimes it's literally like being intentional with sitting time for just self to really connect and tap in. And so that book, it has like journal. I love, I love um, like arts and crafts, color and painting, things like that. So the book has like journaling prompts. Um, it has like open journaling pages. If you just want to journal, um, it has mandala art where you can color. And then on each page, it has like uh, affirmations and um, you know, things like that. And it talks about what mindless time is and why it's important. So I would say that because in a world where it's always something going on and in the age of social media, you can, you know, you think you're going on the scroll for 10 minutes and next thing you know, it's been an hour or two, Mm. you know, I think it's important to um, try to get in the habit of really sitting with yourself, right? That's uncomfortable for so many people. So many people can't, can't do that. And so I think that's the the biggest thing because then I, I think I think whatever you're going through, you'll be able to tap in better to be able to to address it, you know. So that's one thing that I would recommend or want to say that we didn't touch on. That's that's really crazy that you like mentioned that. I've been struggling with that a lot this week. Mm. Like I've been even my friend sent me a video and I hadn't talked to him in a while and I've been meaning to like reply I just couldn't find myself and then I ended up watching the video and they were talking about distractions and finding those quiet times and I was like okay that makes sense it's just it's so difficult like I deleted Instagram either yesterday or the day before yesterday because it's like Mm -hmm. okay I do find myself scrolling a lot and getting Mm -hmm. distracted but then I ended up just on YouTube instead, just scrolling because they have shorts now. Right. And I'm really trying to find, because even when I go to make food or eat, there's always something, I'm always looking for something to be mm. playing yeah. versus literally mm-hmm. just eating. And just sitting, yeah. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. This book, I'm going to get that really- book. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, but that's so many people, and that's what. But that is that is a part of the catalyst for a lot of things that we feel. We feel overwhelmed mm-hmm. and the anxiety, or why I feel so down, and you don't realize it's a subconscious thing. But it's like every time, you know, I mean, and there's so much stuff you could be consuming when we would look at social media, you know, um, and sometimes we just need a break. So with our community, we do social media detoxes all the time. Or one thing that I do that has been life changing for me, I don't, I have not, even with everything going on in the world, in the last, I don't think I've watched the news, even during the pandemic, elections, Mm. in like maybe six years. What I do is I just go to BBC or I'll just go look it up and I get the mm. news based on how I want it. Because, you know, when you turn on the news, breaking news, yeah. this, this, you can't control that. You know, in social media, when you scroll, you might scroll and see something that you don't want to see. And I think it um, it waters down the human experience because we come we become normalized to trauma. Right. Because it's all the way it's always on our timeline. We always hear it on the news and it takes away from that human experience to me. Right. And so one thing that I started doing, and I actually have a clip on my, um, on my Instagram page about the way to start your day. Cause it makes a difference. Mm-hmm. If you start your day watching, watching the news, or as soon as you wake up and open your eyes, you're looking through your emails. It's like, no, that used to be me. It's like, no. And then you wonder why when you start your day, you're anxious or you're like, oh, you know, you're overwhelmed or you're on edge. It's like, no, you know what? I could at least give myself the first 30 minutes or hour of my day to just be. So what I my morning routine is I don't check my phone for at least the first hour after I wake up. I have it on mm-hmm. do not disturb. And um, I will read. I usually read something. Um read the Bible, pray, meditate, do a devotion, um, kind of set my intentions. You can journal it down or you can just mentally set your intentions for the day. Maybe what's your, what's your theme for today? Execution. All right. You know, and then if you want to pick up your phone, do it then or set limits, like set a timer and get off. Cause I know we set timers and we'll push snooze. Stop. <laughs> right. But actually hold yourself accountable and get off. Like the phones now have a thing like, Hey, your limit is reaching or on Instagram. It says, Hey, your, your sleep time is coming yeah, up. You know? I'd be like extend. <laughs> See? Right. We got to say, okay, let's do it. And then replace it with, I actually have a, a copy here, like replace it with things, you know, you can turn on some music or like mm. some uh, uh, instrumental. That's my favorite thing. I'll put on some music And then I'll just find a page in here and I'll, you know, color or I'll look at, I don't know if you see it, look at, no. It's really bright. Yeah. Oh yeah. Bring it close. Okay. Well, let me see if I can, (laughs) the sun, but anyway, positive affirmations, like positive affirmations. You can color Uh that and then like talk about what your intentions are with this book, you know, just different things like that. Um, I, that's what I do now. When I feel antsy and like, oh, I want to scroll. I want to look at something, turn on some music, light a candle, mm-hmm. just set a vibe for myself, make some tea. I like, I'm a tea drinker. I like tea, you know, and then get into it, you know? And like I said, if you like um, journaling, you can journal. If you like coloring, it's coloring in here. Um, and then it's a lot of, it's affirmations on every page. So, you know, and I, you can't really. Oh, I see a butterfly. The sun. Yeah. <laughs> But it's like over 135 pages of like journaling and stuff like that. So that's just in the, it says relax, journal, color, affirm. So that's just, so, and even if it's not this book, like Mm -hmm. just get, find a hobby, you know, if you like writing, get back into that, getting outside, getting fresh air, letting the sun touch you, kiss you, all those things and just get fresh air, especially in the day of working from home and, virtual life most people it's like did you go outside in the last two days <laughs> like now getting groceries delivered and food it's like people are not socializing yeah. or getting out into the elements like they used to so yeah I, so yeah that book <laughs> reminds that and then some of the the services and like groups that we have at life begins here that's the focus like treating the whole person because it's mm. all connected you know right you can't you can't ignore we can't talk about your mental health without talking about your sleep. We can't talk about your mental health without talking about your 
nutrition or your relationships, you know, with people or, you know, um, spiritually, you know, what's going on there. Just, yeah. So we just, yeah, look at all that type of stuff. So hopefully, well, yeah, that answer. <laughs> no, that, that was really good. Need to hear that. Definitely you should work on some things. Um, yeah. Work towards some things. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <sighs> Dr. Lowe, thank you so much for joining us today. Mm -hmm. This was such a great conversation. I it definitely was. I enjoyed you. I enjoyed y'all. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, can you please leave us with any closing remarks and then uh, where people can either connect with you or your resources or website? Yes, I, I think the biggest thing that I always like to leave people with is remember that you are worthy. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that may say, sound cliche, but if you really just like meditate on that, you know, whether that's in your job and your relationships, um, buying yourself something or um, doing starting a new routine or something for yourself or a goal that you have, whether it be something physical or um, financial or whatever, like you are worth it. Um, or mm -hmm. to our, to my point, what we spoke about today, even if it's your doctor or whoever, like you're worthy of that. And you are your biggest advocate and you mm -hmm. are the expert on you. Only you know what goes on inside of you. So always remember that. Um, so that's the biggest thing I think today. And then, um, where you guys can find me. So I, so at life begins here or life begins here. TCS is our Instagram and Facebook and, um, at the melanated mummy tribe is our Instagram and Facebook. And we also have like Twitter and YouTube and TikTok. but you can just go to, to make this easy, uh, linktree.com slash Dr. Kim Lowe. And you can find all the sites there. You can find a link to purchase our The Art of Mindless Time book, um, YouTube pages, all that jazz. Our websites, if you want to subscribe to our mailing list um, to learn more about our communities and groups, you know, you can go to the link tree um, slash Dr. Kim Lowe to sign up for those things or find all those links. That'll be the easiest place to go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you Yay. so much again. And thank you audience for listening today. And remember to keep creating a village wherever you go. Bye. Bye-bye. Yes. <laughs>